for all being here and discovering that we are upstairs and not downstairs. There are some people who are now downstairs probably being totally educated in a new field of knowledge. So this afternoon, first up, Richard Griffiths talking about my favourite island, Little Barrier or Hauturu. Following rat and cat eradication, it is now back to its magic original. Thank you, Dick. Everyone can hear me? Yes. So I, you, some of you will recognise me from this morning. I work for Island Conservation, but uh, in a past life I used to work for the New Zealand Department of Conservation. And I got to look after the most beautiful parts of the world, such as that. And uh, this is just not quite happening as it was supposed to. Anyway, for those who don't know where Hauturu or Little Barrier Island is, it's located in the Outer Hauraki Gulf, about 100 kilometres uh, uh, north from Auckland, New Zealand's largest city. Uh, before I carry on, I just wanted to transport you into the spirit of the island and uh, get you out of this lecture theatre for a, for a few brief seconds. Um, so imagine you're sitting up on the ridge, the ridge line of Hauturu. It's uh, early in the morning, the mist is swirling around, everything's green, lush, moss drapes on the trees, and you're listening to this. Starting with the, the bellbirds, the turi, and then the haunting call of the kōkako. Can't stop it. <laughs> oh shoot! <clears throat> Here we go. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, people arrived, and Hauturu's isolation ended about 800 years ago, uh, when Polynesian voyagers arrived. Um, they brought with them the kiori or Pacific rat which uh, thereafter slowly worked its way through many of the island's seabirds, extirpating several species, and may even have been responsible for eliminating uh, tree species from within the forest. Europeans caused the next major disruption to the island. When they arrived, they, uh, they logged part of the island, they grazed sheep and cattle across some of it, and surprise, surprise, they introduced these guys. Inevitably, this led to uh, extinctions, including the uh, North, North, Island uh, North Island species of snipe. They extirpated the saddleback, amongst other species. And this beautiful bird, the black petrel, would have gone the same way if Dick Veach hadn't arrived on the scene with the Wildlife Service and over three very hard years um, worked to remove cats on Hauturu. It wasn't until 25 years, or nearly 25 years later that uh, rats were targeted, uh, but rats were removed uh, using aerial application of bait containing bradificum in 2004. What were the short-term impacts of uh, this, these interventions? Well, some species were inadvertently caught in leg hold traps uh, during the cat eradication. Uh, kiwi were caught but were released. Some cooks petrol were caught. So there was some, some uh, individual mortality as a consequence of the cat eradication. It was negligible. Interestingly though, after the cats were gone, rats were able to play and they uh, reduced breeding success on, for Cook's petrel, um, preying on, on nests. And you can see a decline in breeding success over time after cats were removed in that slide. Uh, following cat removal, uh, three species were introduced or reintroduced, including the saddleback, the kōkako, as you just heard, and the flightless, uh, flightless parrot, the kākāpō. 
Impacts from the rat eradication, as predicted, were minor. There was some loss of individuals within the island's forest bird community. Uh, but mist netting, oh, I'm way, way out of whack here. Mist netting completed uh, immediately prior and after the eradication couldn't detect any changes in abundance, diversity, or um, species composition, indicating that the, the operation had a, a limited effect on the bird populations. Uh, interestingly, this is a nice little anecdote. Bellbirds did increase in number immediately after the eradication. There was a, a pulse in, in breeding, and uh, they established on a nearby adjacent piece of the mainland um, where they had just recently removed pests and um, built a pest-proof fence. Uh, this was the first time they were seen breeding back on the Auckland mainland for 100 years. Cook's petrel showed an immediate response after rats were removed with breeding success going from roughly 10% up to, to upwards of 60%. So phenomenal, phenomenal result. And uh, bird rescue centres on the adjacent mainland were inundated with uh, disorientated fledging chicks that crossed the, the mainland to go out to the Tasman Sea. Ah, we're getting... Looking at uh, longer term impacts now, uh, Wetapunga, this is our heaviest uh, invertebrate, it, uh, and a favourite uh, subject of Chris Green up there. This, uh, this invertebrate doubled in, in abundance as uh, detected by, well, as um, in terms of unit per search effort, number of Weta found. And uh, they doubled every two years, so have doubled in abundance every two years subsequent to the, the rat eradication. Reptiles, similarly, have just gone through the roof. Uh, several species have increased dramatically, um, contributing to the exponential increase in trap catches <coughs> over time. Uh, forest. Plant, uh, plant and tree species, of the 34 species that were monitored, 14 showed a significant increase in seedling numbers found after rats were removed. Fortunately, they had no impact on the, the weed populations on the island, and uh, they haven't changed. Uh, interestingly, the impacts on forest birds are less easy to explain. Um, Dick, Veach, Dick Veach has a uh, poster uh, downstairs on the subject and can talk to you more. Some species have declined, some species have increased. Uh, Tuatara, they, this species was on its last legs uh, before, prior to the rat eradication and the entire population had to be taken into captivity to ensure um, population recruitment. Subsequent to the rat eradication, they have been released, including all of the juveniles that were bred while the, the animals were in captivity, and they are now established and breeding in the wild. Chevron skink, only one had ever been found before on the island. They're now up to four and counting subsequent to the rat eradication. So it's making a comeback, um, a slow, slow one. Black petrel. Uh, it's another species that uh, is less, uh, uh, more complicated to explain. Breeding success increased dramatically after cats were removed, but the population hasn't expanded significantly, as Biz tells me. Oh, yeah, I've got the slides a bit mixed up. Um, the, the problem for the, for the population on Hoturu is that uh, there's a much larger, noisier population on nearby Great Barrier Island that uh, attracts the young birds uh, away. Uh, getting on to the more, even more exciting uh, news, forest ringlet uh, butterfly, an endemic species never before seen on the island, was found uh, present in reasonable numbers a few, uh, just last year. <coughs> its uh, survival and uh, um, rebound since the, 
since the operation is uh, possibly related to the fact that uh, wasps, um, an which are an invasive species in New Zealand, uh, disappeared just uh, serendipitously after rats were removed. And someone's looking into that because that's a very interesting. Um, uh, aquatic invertebrates, a recent survey found eight new species of aquatic invertebrate on Hauturu that weren't recorded prior to rat and cat eradication. Uh, what was I going to say here? Uh, gray, gray faced petrels have been rediscovered breeding on the island. And I wanted to talk about this, this bird, which is um, quite an incredible story. This species was uh, rediscovered in 2003. Uh, it had been thought to be extinct for 110 years. And thanks to some very clever detective work, has been found breeding on, on Hauturu subsequent to rat and cat eradication. And I'll end there, but I did want to say that uh, we may never get back to the original state um, that the island was in when um, people arrived in New Zealand, but in terms of biodiversity recovery, it is, it's a, a very exciting um, result and one that uh, I hope we can emulate elsewhere. I did want to say we need to share these stories far and wide if we're going to inspire uh, the international community to, to get, get behind us and, and support our work. Thank you. So I squeeze in one question. <laughs> yes. Only on Hauturu, as far as we're aware. Yeah. It is. It started to recover after the cats were removed. Yes. His rat eradication helped it immensely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Next, we have Liz presenting a paper, which I see Michael Bell is the leader of it. So <laughs> Birds and more seabirds about Ramsey Island, and doubtless it'll be ground-based operation. <laughs> but when you looked at the little barrier picture, she didn't wasn't game to offer her services there. <laughs> I was only nine. <laughs> uh, yes, so um, great pleasure to talk about the Ramsey eradication. So one of the first that uh, wildlife management did in uh, the UK, and yes, it was a bait station operation. Uh, so Ramsey Island is uh, in the Pembrokeshire coast, St David's coastline. It's part of the Pembrokeshire Coast National Park. It's been owned by the RSPB since 1992 and since then they've been doing seabird monitoring there uh, ever since. It's got a number of designations, so anything you can possibly throw at Ramsey, it's got it. Triple SIs, IBAs, SPAs, uh, marine... Uh, marine protection areas. So it's, it's a really important site for a number of bird species, but particularly the chuff, and uh, also for marine mammals, particularly the Atlantic seal, grey seal. So yes, we did an eradication. It started in 1999 when uh, lots of volunteers went out and put bait stations all over the island for us. And then we came back in March, uh, in between January and March and put out diphenicum bait across the island. 165 kilos was eaten by rats, and the heat map at the end sort of shows where the distribution was of those bait takes. So uh, relatively even with a few hot spots in, in amongst a few places. But I'm actually here to talk about the Manx shearwaters and the storm petrels. And like I said, the RSPB have actually been monitoring a number of both seabird and landbird species on the island, but uh, we'll talk about these two special guys. We're going to focus on Manx shearwaters first, but the island was split into 42 sub-areas to monitor for all the seabirds, and full counts of suitable burrows was undertaken, and then we used tape playback to see how many of those burrows were active uh, for breeding pairs. So like I said, we'll do the Manx shearwaters first, and 
it's a pretty exciting story. So in 1999, in the first, this, this uh, column I want you sort of to ignore, this is when we suddenly realised that some of these burrows we were looking at and assuming were bird burrows were actually rabbit, rabbit burrows. So we've got a little bit better at detecting what is a real seabird burrow and what isn't. But this is the exciting one on this end, where in 1999 uh, we had about 850 breeding pairs, and since the eradication, it's increased fivefold to nearly 5,000 birds. So it's pretty exciting. And of course, it's not just the numbers. The density of breeding burrows has increased, and so has their range. So this is in 99 when the eradication was just before it just happened and the densities of these 42 areas that we survey. And since then, sort of every five, four to five years apart, we've done other surveys. And as you can see, the density has really increased and so has the range of where the Manx shearwaters are found. And in fact, we actually are now searching 44 sub-areas because they have expanded into two new sites. So that's pretty great. And again, in that uh, theme of collaboration between uh, types of projects, some of the Ramsey team came back over to New Zealand and learnt about how we do seabird translocations, but also just some artificial burrow work. And uh, we've been doing seabird translocations in New Zealand for a fair while, and we make these artificial burrows so that we can make artificial colonies and try and attract birds in. But what Ramsey needed to do is they wanted to create an artificial colony so that they could have access to a little study colony because a lot of burrows in Ramsey itself are really inaccessible, exceedingly long, difficult to get into. So they thought if we put in 20 to 50 artificial burrows, we can set up a little colony that we can then monitor Manx shearwater productivity but also use whatever birds that come there for tracking studies. So we dug these in, they've got a little chamber and house with a roof, it's got turf on top to keep the heat down and then a curved tunnel so that the light doesn't get in and the birds can move in there. So this is the team working very hard putting those in place. So these were established in 2013 and 2015 uh, to help us move along. And excitingly, in 2015, we had the first evidence of some birds prospecting. So they definitely came in and had a nosy and had a look around. And then in 2016, two pairs successfully bred in one of the study colonies. And uh, there are seven pairs using these burrows this season. So where to for here for Manx shearwaters on Ramsey? Well, the numbers are still going up, which is great to see. Um, but we're also now in collaboration with Oxford University doing some tracking work, um, which is basically what these artificial burrows were put in for. And so geolocator log has been put on in collaboration with Oxford. University and lots and lots of PhD students. And the red dots show their tracks on outward migration and the yellow dots show their inward migration back to Ramsey Island. So this is sort of uh, relatively recent tracking work done and basically there's hopefully a lot more PhD students who are out there who are wanting to do a lot more work uh, on Ramsey <coughs> and on these exciting species. And then for the storm petrels, it's a, it's a completely different story because, of course, they weren't actually present on Ramsey after the rats uh, being, were, were being there. But they were thought to be present on the bishops and clerks, which is a little group of uh, rock stack with a lighthouse on, uh, just off the end of Ramsey. But it's quite difficult to get there and it's quite difficult to survey, so nobody really confirmed where the storm petrels were there. Although, now more recently, they do do survey work on those islands for storm petrels. But since the eradication, surveys have for the Manx shearwaters have also been using to uh, look for storm petrels as well. And in suitable habitat, lots of play tape playback has been used again to try and get more information about storm petrels. And excitingly, in 2008, the first pairs were detected here. And ever since then, in the same site, we've got a fair few more pairs. So although we had a couple of years where we didn't survey them, numbers have 
slowly gone up, and this se season, 12 pairs were detected responding to the tapes. So that's pretty fantastic. And of course, you know, we need Ramsey to, contain, to continue to be rat free. So biosecurity is ongoing and it's maintained with regular checks by the team there, both volunteers and the wardens who are present on the island at all time. They're also doing ongoing monitoring of Manx shearwaters and storm petrels and a whole heap of other species on the island. And this is one thing to recognise about eradications. It's really important to do that pre and post monitoring of species to see and document that recovery because that, like Richard says, helps us expand those messages to people around the world and the public to commit to these eradication projects. So uh, on that note, is there any questions? Speedy process. Questions? It's a great project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so you do it with uh, fledglings, and you do it before they leave the burrow. Mm -hmm. So, and then you basically spend a lot of time feeding them until they fledge themselves. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, when you um, you go to see if there's any rats there, if you were to find the infestation a little bit, do you maintain like a supply of bait or something there so that you can respond immediately? Yeah. So part of the RSPB policy is we've got a rapid response team, basically, that are on call. So regulations in the UK mean you can't have bait in bait stations permanently. So you've got monitoring using tracking tunnels and chocolate wax and things like that. But then there's a response team ready on call to get on the island within 48 hours of a rat being detected. Uh, in a couple of islands, yes, so on Canna there were uh, one family in particular had domestic cats and they were quite happy to let them die out when they did the same. And actually on St Agnes and Goo we had the same question um, and several farmers were definitely keen to get rid of their cats as soon as they didn't have to have them around for eating all the rats. Yeah, so, I mean, there are still families on St Agnes who have pet cats and we never w wanted to talk to them get it out of their pet cats, but they were quite happy to just minimise the numbers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ruth. No worries. Very good. <laughs> so next up we have Yuliana eh? speaking about Mexican islands and lots of stories about stories. the numbers of seabirds and the numbers of islands. That green you go, getting there, look at that. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you. Well, I work for the Grupo de Ecología y Conservación de Islas, a Mexican conservation organization. And, well, I will talk about our encouraging results that we had been obtained the last decade in our civil restoration program that we started after the eradication of invasive mammals. Well, to give a little of contest, oh God. Oh my God, sorry. Um, that's not a presentation. This is that I have to yeah, the update it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry for that. So, well, Mexico has more than 4,000 islands that are key sites for one third of the silver species worldwide, uh, which plates Mexico as the second country in terms of endemics, but also as one of the 10 countries with more threats. Um, well, in particular, the Baja California Pacific Islands uh, surrounded by very productive waters, uh, support an important breeding colonies of 22 seabird species. Well, and on these islands, uh, during the last century, many seabird populations were extirpated Popula many populations were decremented, and also the Guadalupe storm petrel is extinct. All, all due to, well, invasive mammals, such as cats, rats, goats, donkeys, and also DDT and oil spills that it happened from 1940 to 1970. And human disturbance too, 
uh, because before in, on that island uh, there was one mining and exploitation of eggs. So uh, Mexico, well, we have a long trajectory. So over the past two decades, we have removed 60 population, as you already hear about it, on 39 islands, and 12 of these islands are in, located on the Baja California Pacific Islands. On these islands, we remove uh, the invasive mammals from 90, 1994 to 2003, mostly, and the last one was in 2013. So, as a continuation of the restoration via eradication, uh, invasive predators eradication, well, we initiated in 2008 our cyber restoration program that includes the monitoring of the natural recovery of breeding success of the seabirds or the recognition, but also the implementation of social attraction techniques for the first time in Latin America uh, to induce recolonization. Well, these techniques uh, consist on installing artificial colonies using decoys for surface nesting species, uh, so here you see the brown cormorant, but also for many species, other species of cormorants, gulls, terns, and recently for, for alb albatrosses. And uh, for burrow nesting species, we are installing also um, artificial burrows of different designs. Here is for cousins outlets, but we have another two designs for storm petals and for um, also, well, uh, the black venture water. Okay, so, and also well, all these, the decoys and the artificial burrows are complemented with sound system that play acoustic playbacks that we, that we use recorded in local colonies. Here you see the speaker in the front of the picture. So, uh, well, not just that, but also we are removing all the invade, invasive vegetation from the islands to enhance uh, breeding habitat for the seabirds and also to reduce human disturbance on some islands with a very high density of burrow nesting species as this one. Here are all full of burrows of cousins outlets. So we have constructed uh, these boardwalks to reduce the human disturbance on the islands where some fishermen uh, go very f frequently. And well, on many islands, we also have designed and installed this kind of signage to, to inform all the users on the islands about the seabirds breeding there and also to give some uh, recommendations during the visits. And well, in addition of the restoration actions, uh, we have attended a vast knowledge gap, uh, generating scientific um, baseline information essential for conservation management, including genetics, diet, and also forging ecology. And as, <laughs> as the islands are the base, economic base for many fishing communities, uh, we carry out um, environmental learning activities with children and also biosecurity uh, talks with fishing cooperatives. Well, uh, that's all we have done for now, but now the good news. Um, but before that, I would like to, to, uh, to show you all the extirpations on these islands. Well, um, according to historical records, at least 28 silver, 28 silver populations were extirpated from these islands. There are a group of eight islands in the Coronado and Todos Santos. There are two islands where invasive mammals were eradicated. So. It's just an example of all the species that were extirpated. So um, on these islands, um, there are some that were more affected than the other ones. In three of them, at least this one, this one, this one, were ex um, ex five species were extirpated. And the groups more affected were oglets, murrelets, pelicans, and cormorants. So this happened the last century. And before our, we started the, the silver restoration program, uh, there are some records in literature of 10 natural recolonizations of these seabirds. So here you see all the ones that just returned around, I don't know, middle 19th and 200, beginning of 200. And after, after our, we started the, the silver restoration program, we, registered 11 uh, additional recolonizations. Four of these 
uh, were assisted with social attractions. So here you see so well, two populations of cousins Oglet and two populations of terns that return it thanks, thanks to the social attraction techniques. So here I show you the cousins Oglet with its egg in uh, breeding in artificial colony and on these islands this species was recorded the last time almost a century ago and after four years that we implemented the social attraction. And it is, in, is our most recent uh, recolonization is just from two months ago on San Roque Islands in the south of the Baja California Pacific. So this species is nesting within the artificial <laughs> colony. You see here the decoys. And it was just recorded 90 years ago and after nine years that we implemented social attraction techniques. For other species that were not extirpated, but the population was, uh, the size population was decremented. Well, social attraction techniques had been effective since the first year. Uh, here is the example of the gull, the Hermann's gull. Here are the, the decoys that they used since the first years, they started breeding within the artificial colony. And the same happened for the double crested cormoran on other islands. So that's our very good news because sometimes these techniques take much longer and sometimes takes eight or nine as with the turns. And well, uh, but all, we, moreover, we also have some new colonies established on these islands never recorded before. So here we have some turns that are breeding already in the mainland but never had been recorded on the islands. And uh, also very inter interesting cases here for the flat footed booby um, pelagic cormorant that the, the southernmost colony of this species was on this island and now it's here. And the blood footed booby is a tropical species that, uh, I don't know, this is the first record in at least breeding here in this part of, of, the, of the Pacific. So, well, um, how has been the recovery over the years of this species here for the cousins Oglet, it, this is just an example, that we have a very good recovery. So, uh, well, the species was breeder here. It was recorded as a breeder. Uh, we don't have any numbers for that. So it was extirpated, I don't know, some decades later, and then we eradicated cat and cats and rats on these islands, but still this species was extirpated until here, almost 20 years. It, it took 20 years to, to come back to the species. It was a natural recovery in this case, and the species had, have a considerable uh, recovery. So now we have at least oh, almost 600 pairs on that island. But uh, we have another cases where the historical records tell us that the population it was well, high, but then um, uh, this is a combination of factors of invasive mammals and all, also with the DDT um, effects. Um, and after the cat eradication and donkey got an eradication, uh, also we implemented social attraction. Well, the numbers are low, so we have to persevere on this kind of uh, situations or cases. Uh, we have to continue with the restoration actions to, to get these numbers again. Oh my God. So, <laughs> uh, so now what we are doing, we are well uh, to maintain all these encouraging results in the long term. What we have to do is, what we are doing now is to developing a biosecurity protocols specific for each island, and all the part to prevent reintroductions on these islands that we have so very good news. So, and we are planning the eradication of invasive vegetation and the reforestation of native species. Uh, we are planning also, well, uh, to continue with the environmental learning activities that have been key for the success of the program. And we are also developing action plans for all the species of seabirds in the Pacific. We are getting fi financial support to continue with this long-term monitoring. And we will start evaluating the uh, interactions of seabirds and fisheries. So to finish, I would like to thank the, all the government agencies, universities, fish cooperatives, and donor, donors that collaborate in this program. Thank you.
Thank you, you now. That's a very grand scale of projects and a wonderful number. And we do have some time for questions. I'm going to slip in the first one. Okay. You briefly, quickly showed fishermen on the island. Right. And to me, this is a little unique in that many of these islands have fishermen going there seasonally to camp when they're fishing, and some of them are even more permanent. Right. How have they been in relation to your eradication and the seabird recovery? Yeah, well, uh, they give us all the logistic support to go to the islands. Um, now, yeah, well, we have spent in, in the field four months every year, so we have a lot of presence there, and we have a lot of interaction with them. Uh, they have been key in specifically for one eradication in the Pacific. They give us all the, yeah, the, the support to, to do the eradication of a, ma uh, a mouse in, on island, so they have been key for, for that. That's good. Mm -hmm. Questions? 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 <coughs> Yes. Yep. Before this one? Yes. Here? Yeah. You have a nice increase of birds uh, in 2006 and then it dropped down in 2013 and then you used a social attraction. Yeah. What, what happened here? Yeah, yeah well, we, we had in these three, well, at least two, these two years, um, anomaly, anomalous event event in the Pacific, it was the blob and also <coughs> combined with the El Nino oh, okay. all together. So it, it, in this case, it was more environmental factors. Mm -hmm. okay. You're welcome. So there's a lot of work going on here on these islands and surely lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Just if you could remind how many natural spontaneous recolonization you had. All right, in total? Um, <laughs> Before? Without using any social attraction or recolonization, I mean, artificial means demented. Before 10. 10 spontaneous. That's right. Okay. Yes. Uh, after, in, in what? Uh, Period of time? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, it's like, I think the records are from 1995 to 2000. Five years. Yeah, in five years. Well, maybe it's because these islands at the beginning, they had a lot of uh, people going to the islands to record all the species. And then there is a very long gap of time without any, um, any report of that. That's happened on these islands sometimes. Did you see here, sometimes uh, I have a continuous line, but then some gaps. So that we are not sure exactly the date when the, the silver juice returned to the islands. Yeah, maybe in the case in this, uh, I will say that in this case, we, we can be sure that at least 20, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Striking very much the same problem that many of us strike in that we haven't been to the island very much uh -huh. before eradication mm -hmm. and indeed to get money to go back and monitor and monitor and monitor is, is harder to get money than for the actual operation. That's right. So, any more? Yeah, there's uh, an extent to that. Um, I wonder if you have any idea um, what proportion of your budget you spend on monitoring versus on eradications. This is, this is a hugely impressive amount of monitoring. Well, I, use, I can tell that uh, this uh, project well, started uh, in a very wide uh, area on all these islands uh, five years ago, and we had um, a budget of around five, four, Four million of dollars to do all these restoration actions. Okay. Eradication and no, only monitoring uh, restoration. All the social attraction systems. <laughs> Where did all the wretched cats come from? The the cats. Uh, it came from people. <laughs> so there are some communities, fishing communities, living on that islands, and they just. The cats. You do have native rodents on some of these islands, don't you? That's right. Yes. We had. So this may be one of the original things about cats. We've got little rats mm -hmm. here. Cats will eat them. Mm -hmm. So they have native rodents through. Would they be on all of the islands? All there are all native rodents on all, all the islands. islands. Mm -hmm. So if you're a fisherman going and camping there, they don't like too many rodents yes, around. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any more? Thank you very much. Lovely.
<laughs> it looks like I've acquired here a, a, a piece which I don't really have a use for. Oh, Tony says he's got a use for it. I <laughs> wish. Okay, next up, where's my bright piece of paper here? Um, sorry, Michael Brook. Got the wrong page, that's why. Um, population growth of seabirds after the eradication of introduced animals, mammals, and this includes lots and lots of islands. Okay, thanks, Dick. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. <coughs> this is very much going to be a talk that looks at what happens to seabirds after mammals have been taken off their island. And uh, as we know from many of the talks that have been presented at this conference so far, the removal of mammals is now very much a cottage industry being carried out worldwide. And this is simply a screenshot from the wonderful island conservation database that tells us where things have happened. And the three biggest um, operations to date for the th three most removable mammals have been on Marin Island, the largest island from which cats have been eradicated, um, the northern part of Isabella from which, in the Galapagos, from which goats have been eradicated, and I hope I'm not tempting fate here, Tony, um, um, South Georgia, the largest island from which rats have been eradicated. And... The question is, why has all this activity been undertaken? And, of course, there are other reasons, but a large amount of the rationale is to benefit birds. Whoops, sorry. And what, how might that benefit manifest itself? Is the penguin happy? Now, that is probably fairly difficult to assess, but we can ask whether the seabird population multiplies after the eradication, and then... Also, we might ask questions about whether that enhancement, that growth of the seabird population, is followed by wider restoration of the ecosystem, of the island ecosystem. But I'm really going to um, concentrate on the um, second of those, does the seabird population multiply after the mammals have been removed? So the rationale for our study is very much that so far there hasn't been a global collation of the data as to what happens to seabirds after mammals have been eradicated. And as uh, one or two other people have mentioned, I think we, the conservation community, need to demonstrate that there is a population response, ideally, of course, a positive response, because without that demonstration, funders are entitled to say, what's the point of us spending the money? And d developing the sort of level of inquiry, we might ask what factors make seabirds more likely to recover rapidly, what factors depress the rate of recovery. And the sort of thing that might enhance the rate of recovery is the size and proximity of the nearest colony. You might think that recovery would be more rapid if there's a big colony nearby. And with that sort of knowledge to hand, we might be in a better position to assess which would be the high priority islands for future eradications and restoration. So the acquisition of data for this project was frankly hard work. And that was because so few monitoring results have been written up in the primary peer-reviewed literature. Most of the data for the study came from correspondence with terrifically obliging people and came from delving into the grey literature. And altogether, um, data came from around 40 wonderful, helpful people. And as a result of their helpfulness, um, Rachel and I acquired... Um, a total of 181 data points. And just to sort of give you a feel for what I mean by a data point, the data that Biz presented on the Manx Shearwater recovery on Ramsey counts as one data point, uh, um, one out of the 181. 
And the metric I, we used was the rate of population change shown by the population. And that is lambda. And where possible, and it wasn't always possible, we split the data um, before or after the age of first breeding of the species. So let's say a seabird species first breeds at five. Um, we asked what was the population growth rate in the first five years versus later. And the rationale for that is that before the age of first breeding, any population growth pretty much must be due to immigration. After that age of first breeding, the population may grow by some combination of continuing immigration and po uh, possibly also enhanced recruitment. Um, young birds born on the island coming back in greater numbers to the island. And um, that um, difference between before and after the age of first breeding is shown in this um, simple graphic. Um, so, relatively slow recovery in the first few years before the age of first breeding, driven by immigration alone, and then possibly a faster rate of increase after the age of first breeding, driven by a combination of immigration and enhanced recruitment. So, what did we find? Was our baby penguin happy? And... This is the overall summary of the data. So the x-axis is lambda, the population growth rate, and we simply have on the y-axis the frequency of various examples of lambda. And lambda equals 1 is a static population. So we do see a, a significant number of populations that actually declined after eradication. But overwhelmingly, populations did increase, so that's the good news. And in fact, the medium value of lambda was 1.119. So a median rate of increase was about 12% a year. And then you see a handful of populations that are actually increasing extraordinarily rapidly after eradications. Lambda 2 is a doubling each year and up to um, 3.5 or thereabouts. And what you'll also notice from this graphic is that where the colony is newly established, indicated by the black section of the columns, there seems to be um, faster growth rates than where the colony is already present. And if we um, split the data according to the rate of increase um, before, um, pre the age of first breeding versus after, post the age of first breeding, we actually see no real sign that it's faster um, after the age of first breeding. So though roughly those two boxes are no higher than those two boxes. If anything, they're slightly lower. So as I've said already, the population growth prior to the age of first breeding, must be driven by immigration. And this, these um, plots make the case that immigration is actually very important in driving population growth in these eradicated seabird colonies. And then the other standout feature of this graphic is that um, lambda is particularly high where there isn't a colony already present. So where the island has been recolonized, growth seems to be particularly rapid. And that, you can sort of say to yourself, well, maybe that's because um, the seabird population in that region is thriving. That contributes to recolonization. And given that um, that indicates regionally favorable conditions, population growth might then be particularly fast. If we compare the rate of population growth shown by different taxonomic groups, there's a clear difference. So lambda is one is no population growth, so all um, groups manage to get above one, okay. But what's conspicuous is that gulls and terns increase in number more rapidly than either petrels or orcs or a kind of hodgepodge, suliformed formed tropic bird grouping. And another marked difference in outcome 
was according to what animals were eradicated. So if it was a, a single species eradication, either generally a, a cat or a rat or a goat, there was population growth, all well and good, but there was a consistent message that the seabird population growth was higher still if you could eradicate um, all the predators in one go. And that, of course, exactly mirrors best practice, try and get rid of all predators in one operation if that's feasible. This is now one of those horror slides that um, you, you shouldn't show, but I am showing it nevertheless. Um, the message here is that um, this is a modelling exercise. Um, blame Rachel for doing this because she's much better at the stats than I am. But the key point is that the two significant factors that show out in a multivariate analysis indicated by the asterisks are the gulls and terns, as we saw a slide or two back, and the mixed predator eradication. But the other factors that you might think could influence rate, say um, the IUCN red um, list status, um, the age of first breeding, size of the source population, and so on, don't actually show up in this analysis as particularly important. So, the good news is that most seabird populations do increase after eradication. Um, there's really rather little signal um, in our data, the lambda is influenced by the size or proximity of the nearest colony, and I think that's a little bit su surprising. Um, but recolonization is slightly more likely if there is a large colony nearby, and I haven't shown you any data on that. And lambda in the early years, before age of first breeding, is no slower than later. If anything, in fact, it's slightly faster. And that, to me at least, suggests the importance of immigration. Perhaps seabirds are less philopatric than we normally credit with them. Perhaps they're on the lookout for a safe haven. And gull and tern colonies grow faster than others. No surprise there, because we know that particularly terns can pitch up anywhere. And we should eradicate all the alien species if possible. This list um, just emphasises the fact that correspondents have been the people who've made this project possible. The lack of published data is, has been a, a severe drawback, a severe impediment. So sample sizes do remain small, um, and it would be wonderful um, if there was more monitoring, as we've just heard about from Mexico, that could provide more data for this sort of study. And that brings me to the end, so thank you very much. Where have I heard that plea for more data, more data, more data before? <laughs> I'm interested to hear that, Michael, thank you. Was there any correlation between vegetation type on these islands because there would have been a change in vegetation following some of those eradications as well which could have subsequently impacted upon the species you're studying did you take that into account um one word no that's it thank you <laughs> we can take a couple of questions I don't think we had any instances where it was clearly due to the baiting regime. It was presu presumably because there were other regional factors, lack of food at sea, for example, um, affecting and causing a decline in the seabird population. Story. Any more questions? Thank you, Mike. Next up, Luciana, talking about changes after goat eradication on Guadalupe Island. Wonderful project. 
Thank you. While they're loading it up. Exciting. It's, uh, there you go. You're on. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello? Just changing the subject a little bit from seabirds to plants. I'm going to talk about the active restoration program that we have for, for the vegetation, the plant, veget the plant communities on Guadalupe Island after the, the goat eradication. Just um, to begin, just the, the location, Guadalupe Island is located in the Pacific Ocean, 260 kilometers offshore of the Baja California Peninsula, which is in here. It's a, one of the big, biggest islands in Mexico. It's a dry ecosystem, a uh, temperate ecosystem, but it's very high, so in the highest parts we get fog, so that's why uh, we are able to have forests in there. It's a best for reserve. It has many unique plants. Many of those are shared with the Channel Islands because where uh, Guadalupe is located, the north, so very close to the, to the Channel Islands. So it's, that's, that's good, that's great. It gave us a great opportunity to, to collaborate with the colleagues across borders despite Trump. So, uh, well, the project started with uh, goats, were introduced to Guadalupe in 1875. Of course, they, they tried, they had a lot, of, a lot of resources, a lot of vegetation in there and um, um, water, so they, they had enough. They, they increased uh, their numbers dramatically, and they, of course, uh, made a big change and the uh, dramatic changes in the, in the vegetation and in the, in the place. So the first um, action, of course, was to remove the, the feral goats from there. So we did that, and of course that uh, gave us great results. So very um, faster than we expected, very resilient ecosystem as all the, the islands. Um, so is, um, if you can see, this is the same image. So this is 2006-2016. And for example, this is the pine uh, oak uh, forest. And from a study uh, conducted in 2001, it was estimated that only 220 adult uh, pines remain. Of, this is an endemic, endemic pine, which, by the way, is one of the most uh, important uh, commercial species uh, harvested around the world. And if you can see like some, taking some references as, as this one, that increased to more than, once that we removed the goats, more than 20,000 uh, young pines. And this was, well, just an example was what was happening with many other species. And some great news, so red discoveries and new records. For example, this uh, plant is a very teeny tiny plant, an endemic mint of, of the island. Um, and also new records, including two, two traps. One of those is, is this one. Maybe you, you can, cannot tell from this picture, but it's actually a very, very big shrub, uh, actually compared, a species compared with the Channel Islands. But unfortunately, even though the recovery is, very, is going very well uh, for many, many species, uh, still the damage was a lot. So this is, is going well, but a very slow uh, pace. But fortunately, uh, we got a project with, in collaboration with the, with the government, the National Forestry Commission and the Natural Protected, protected Areas in, in, in Conservación de Islas. We come together and we started our project in 2015 to restore several plant communities that include cypress, pine, oak, and palm, also working with species from chaparral and scrubland. Through reforestation, which is the main component of the project, uh, soil erosion uh, management and fire management. So uh, this is an, an example of one of the areas we're, we're working on. So what happened is here we have again the, the, the pines. I don't know if you can see the black dots in there, but those were the remaining pines. So this is, there used to be a whole forest. This is a picture from 2004 before the, the goats were eradicated. So that was the um, situation back there. So we have some pines in here and then nothing and then some other pines in here. And what is uh, happening now, the, the pines that um, are recovering is that they're increasing but around the, the, the pines, around the adult tree. So the idea is just to try to restore this original distribution and just to put some trees back in this and to just make the, the gap uh, smaller. And again, this is, well, there's um, the yellow uh, polygons are the places where we're going to be working on 120 hectares. So these are just some pictures of the species uh, that are part of the project, the, the pine, the endemic cypress, uh, the island oak, uh, uh, this species also shared with the Channel Islands. It's this, it's, and Mexico is the only place where uh, you can find it. Also endemic shrubs, as uh, this, this in here, scrubs, 
very um, interesting species, many of those endemic to, to the island. And well, for doing so, of course, we uh, first needed to build uh, some infra infrastructure. We have a plant nursery on the island right now. And the main predators for seedlings are an endemic uh, bird. We cannot do nothing about that one. It's very charismatic and it's, okay, unique endemic. Um, for, and for that, for that the, the, the shade uh, works very well. But also we have uh, house mice. Introduced mice is the, the only rodent on, on the island. And for keep it uh, away from the plants, we needed to build a uh, closure. Though. So as you can see in there, the project includes um, around 30 species, mostly trees. So the main uh, species that we are producing in this project is the pine, cypress, and also um, oaks. So we took some plants to the field last year, uh, 10,000 in the last year, and right now in the nursery we have 75,000, which we're going to take to the, to the first. So we, we start with the production at the early spring, and we uh, try to take all the plant to the first rain, we, which used to be beginning of December, now not anymore. Um, so it's just waiting for the rain, but the fog, the fog is very, very, very important for the survival of the plants in, in there. So here we have a picture of the cypress and the oak. Also some actions um, to restore the, the soil. Being a volcanic island, we didn't have like a lot of soil. And so without the vegetation coverage, we uh, were losing a lot of, of this element which is critical to, to the, for the vegetation establishment, as, as you know. So building some uh, contour barriers, uh, check dams to retain soil and to um, allow the establishment of, of the plants. Also some fire management actions, fuel reduction. There's a lot of, especially the cypress forest, there's a lot of materials that we need to remove big uh, trunks and also a lot of uh, avena introduced. We have a lot of weeds in there, a lot of grasses, and also fire breaks. So we're um, a fire break that used to be there. We're um, maintaining this one and also creating a new one. This is everything is um, all the decisions are with the National Forestry Commission, which are the, the, the ones that uh, make decisions on that matter because it, it is a protected area. Of course, we have some challenges. And one of those limited amount of seed for some species, for example, this, the juniper, which is a native species for the region, but it's still uh, we haven't done the genetics, so we don't know if it is something that could be unique to, to Guadalupe. And in the meanwhile, we are restricting to use the, the seed. Luckily, we found some, some seed, so those are good news. Uh, this year, just a couple of months ago, we found some, so luckily they're going to be uh, viable and, and, and good for, for the project. But that's, that's the thing. We only have like around 10 um, individuals of this species, and it, it's uh, an example. We have many others. Another is a plant that used to be very abundant on, on the island. So Guadalupe is just the big main island, and there are three islets. And the goats were only on the main island, and the islets were just always free of goats and, and mice and cats are just paradise. Uh, par uh, very, very unique places. So many of the plants uh, had a refugee in, in there. So it's a good, a great place to, to collect a seed and to take it to, to the nursery. So that's, that's good to have those places. And also because we lose a lot of soil and of course all the nutrients and the place and, and um, mycorrhizal fungi, which is in a place like this where that's very dry and um, it was a lot of uh, impact on the soil this is uh, critical. So we go and collect the spores and we t uh, take it to the nursery and then we uh, try to, to make, because these guys are going to have it hard when they're going back to the field. So we are trying to, to minimize their, the impact for them. So to just to send the, the healthiest plants that we can to the, to the field. Another is just, well, climatic change. We cannot do. Um, uh, we have had a uh, drought in the region for several years. Luckily this year we were all excited because we were having all this uh, water, all this rain, but it, it was just a normal year. The, the only thing is that we, we had um, droughts for so many years that when we actually came the normal rain was just so exciting. But anyway, that is going to be a, a pattern for the region in the following year, years. 
hopefully this year will be will be good. But if not, we're relying on fog, of course, which is um, our main uh, ally in that place, and also using any other things that we can use and um, that we can. Um, um, some other sources that are available as uh, this is um, um, a polymer that will uh, retain the humidity for um, and, and it will make it available for the plant for several months instead or for only one month or so. So just to, to finish, uh, the actions for the near future of course will be uh, trying to uh, promote the establishment of the plant that we take into the field and also the research linked to propagation to develop all this um, publications or information that could be available for us for the next years of the project because many of these are endemic species so there's not much information about, about propagation but also maybe this information could be used for other other projects similar projects in other places also this project uh, started in 2015 and ends in 2018 so we need to to get additional funds that can afford the National Forestry Commission is very interested and in keep going but they're not, and there are critical times in Mexico as in many other places for environmental issues. So we need to secure that and to try to, to do that same project in other islands where, as Socorro, where uh, herbivores have been removed. And also strengthen collaboration with partners within Mexico and across borders. Now we have a very um, close um, a collaboration with uh, colleagues from, from the states, especially in, from the Channel Islands, but also just to other, other places as other colleagues in other places. And well, that, that's it. I we want to acknowledge some of the funders. And that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very harsh environment after those goats came <laughs> off. You made no mention of any weeds invading. What weed would want to go and live there? I, yeah, I know. We have like 40 something. Yeah. A problem? Yeah, well, mostly the grasses, because all the fire regime that has been, yeah. the, there was a fire in 2008, and the main reason was, well, the, it entered the forest because of the, the grasses. Grass. So we are, grasses. yeah, we're focusing. Yep. Are there any photos or images of the islands uh, before goats were introduced? No. No, there, there are descriptions, very good descriptions, which is good. It's more than that we have for other places. So there's a flora, very complete, and a lot of uh, naturalists visited the place in the early, around 1850s, uh, 60s. So the first att attempt to introduce the goats to the island uh, was in 1850, but it wasn't um, successful, but they yeah, they insisted and it took some in 1875, but unfortunately, I think the first uh, description, like very well, descri uh, very well like, um, written, was in 18, 1885 or something like that, just before. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Goats were there before cameras were invented. <laughs> okay, more questions? Uh, so you mentioned that there's, there's house mice on the island, and after seeing all these, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so far, um, even though the, they do cause impacts on, on seedlings, like the, when they're just emerging from the seed in the, in the nursery, after that, they're not a big uh, issue. And in other places, for example, when they are permiscus, like native rodents, they will, if you have oak um, acorns, they will just predate on those, and those won't be able, viable anymore. We were worried about that because we really needed the acorns. We have like 40 oaks, so we, are, we were um, very jealous about the acorns. Um, but no, no my house mice are not an, an issue, probably because they have still many other, like a lot of uh, food resources. We haven't, of course, probably they're affecting invertebrate, invertebrates and native plants, but maybe not at the, at the amount of in, in other places. Mm -hmm. Do you have native rodents here as well? 
No. no we only rodents. have cats and mice in this yeah. island. I would suggest that the, the habitat for those rodents was pretty, meant a pretty low population mm -hmm. immediately after goat eradication. But I think you might get more problems as you revegetate. The rodent no, 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 population no, no. might come up. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah, maybe. So are you working on any programs to get the rodents off? No. No. We'll be working with cats, but not with mice. Your future employment may just have to change from plants to animals. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Jeremy Bird, Jez from, I'm not sure, he's University of Queensland, I read, but then it said UK after it, so uh, there's a bit of a mixture. <laughs> bit of Australians a migrating, willingly migrating back to the motherland. Uh, well, let's <laughs> move on. He's going to tell us about responses to eradications, and it looks like another wind, another gathering of multiple data. Look forward to it. Thanks very much. Yeah, can everyone hear okay? Uh, so I'm delighted to be finishing a session talking about recovery on islands. Um, I'm starting a PhD looking at recovery of burrowing petrels on Macquarie Island. Um, but before we can know whether things have recovered, we need to monitor them. Um, so as I've started out on my PhD, I sort of want to get a, a handle on the state of what monitoring is taking place. We've seen uh, some amazing talks about a huge amount of monitoring happening uh, on some islands, but I want to sort of know if that's the case uh, elsewhere. Um, so, first of all, I, I want to say this work um, has developed uh, a lot of interest groups and it continues to expand. Um, we've got more and more collaborators. Um, tomorrow, there's a session being run with RSPB um, discussing post eradication monitoring. Um, so, I'd like to flag that for anyone with an interest to come along. Uh, and I'd love to talk to people here about their monitoring during the week. So um, please come and find me if I don't find you first. These are a number of papers with pretty uh, high profile, clear messages on some of the responses that we see following eradication. Um, but what's clear when you delve into a lot of these papers is that, uh, as Mike said, it's very difficult to find much information in the published literature, at least. Um, Holly Jones's work with colleagues um, looked at uh, responses across islands. And while looking for information for 500 islands, they only found uh, about 22 studies that covered, I think, 63 species, um, showing what sort of responses were, were being documented. Um, Obviously, there's a clear trade-off with monitoring. Uh, it's costly. The more uh, taxi you monitor, the nature of your site, the frequency with which you want to monitor um, is going to affect the overall cost, but it can quickly become very expensive. Uh, and would we rather invest those resources instead in future um, eradication operations? So, to start this review, we're really looking at uh, what motivations people have for monitoring. Um, there's a pretty extensive literature about that. Uh, and from it, we've pulled out um, four kind of key areas. So were um, projects end goals achieved? Um, were target uh, species or habitats responding the way people that designed the eradication operation wanted to see? Um, do you want to see how non-target uh, species or habitats respond? So have a broader uh, surveillance monitoring in place. Those things look at kind of the patterns that we can see through monitoring. Um, but if we do see some changes, we also may want to know what mechanisms are driving those changes. So the process for why things are responding following an eradication as they are. Um, that can help us collectively, adaptively manage for the future. Um, and all of those things feed into reporting. Reporting may or may not be important for your project. So if you're a big publicly funded project, there's probably quite a high emphasis on having to demonstrate to the public who funded that uh, the outcomes from your operation. 
But if you're funded by a philanthropist, a single donor, they may not be too worried about what those um, outcomes are. They, they trust you to say, no, actually, go and get on with the next operation. That's a better use of your money. So I want to flag here um, a couple of things we know, need to know to start with. Up there on the top left, uh, were the end goals achieved? Well, we need to know what were those end goals in the first place. Were they clearly articulated for that project? So that's one of the, the key pieces of information we're trying to collect. Um, and bear in mind that the motivation for your monitoring um, can lead to quite different perceptions on the outcomes of, a uh, of an eradication operation. Um, so in the case of Dana Bergstrom's paper that I flagged earlier, um, they concluded that the eradication of cats from Macquarie Island in the late 90s um, ultimately had a, a devastating impact on the island because rat and rabbit numbers increased massively. Now that came about through surveillance monitoring on the island where they were picking up what were previously unanticipated uh, outcomes. Um, so that kind of monitoring program delivers a certain sort of conclusion. If you looked at that project through the lens of what were the end goals of that operation, they were trying to prevent the extinction of burrowing petrels on Macquarie Island, um, and they succeeded in that. Uh, there are more burrowing nest, burrow nesting seabirds now on the island, more species than there were prior to the cat eradication. So understanding um, what motivation you have for monitoring uh, is quite key to this exercise. So on to uh, our review, um, it's essentially we're wanting to do a sort of synthesis um, or stock take, if you will, of what's happening on islands in terms of monitoring at the moment. So uh, you can start out by looking at what taxonomic groups or habitats occur on the island. So what could you monitor? Which were the taxonomic groups or habitats that drove the operation you were uh, involved in? So arguably, what should you monitor? Uh, and then what's actually being monitored? We're also going to collect uh, a whole load of metadata around the operations and the monitoring. Um, how much does it cost? Uh, what type of organisations funding it? Um, which invasives were eradicated, what was the size of, of island, where this took place, what latitudes, what geographies, um, to try and see if there's any sort of patterns driving why people monitor and, and when they do that. Um, the database of island invasive species eradications run by IC has, has been flagged a number of times already. It's a great resource and we're using it as the backbone for our study. Um, there's over a thousand islands in there now. Um, so to try and get us down to a more manageable number to, to look at to start with, we're focusing on key geographies. Um, one of the reasons for that, as Mike said, um, often the information we'll be after is not available in, in uh, published literature. So having key regional experts to uh, help gap fill for us is going to be very important. We're also really aware of expert fatigue. So we're a small community, and the same people often get asked over and over to supply information for these kinds of, of synthesis studies. Um, so we're starting out in places where we have good existing relationships with individuals who can help with this. Um, but I'm really keen during the week to, to expand and add in areas. Um, initially, we're looking at islands around Tasmania, uh, islands of Western Australia, islands in the tropical Pacific, um, and islands in the Caribbean. But it'd be great to, uh, to add in UK islands or Mexican islands elsewhere to, to try and get a bigger picture of what's happening globally. So what will the data look like as we collect it? Um, here's an example of Rose Atoll, a government-funded eradication. Um, Polynesian rats were removed in 1990. Uh, to protect seabirds and threatened turtles nesting on the island. Um, there are more taxonomic groups present there. Um, and as you can see by what monitoring has actually taken place, um, the biggest focus has been on uh, those drivers of that eradication operation. It's great to be able to, to link back to why did we do this in the first place. Um, but there's also really broad surveillance monitoring of other things going on there. 
Uh, another example is Viwa, an island in Fiji, um, where there was a, an NGO-led eradication of rats and cats in 2006. That was to protect the threatened uh, Fiji ground frog. Um, and again, there's been most monitoring um, before and since um, on the population of amphibians there, um, with, with other monitoring happening again. So what do we think the results will look like as we pull all this data together? Um, I think it's, it's sort of too soon to say what power we'll have to pick up, um, to model drivers um, of why things are being monitored where. But I do think we'll have pretty good understanding of the broad patterns. So what sort of proportion of projects are monitoring their end goals? Um, what sort of taxonomic to, uh, coverage do we have in our monitoring? So, I mean, as we've heard, seabirds are especially well monitored, but um, do we need to focus a bit more on how reptiles respond to eradication operations? Uh, and the kind of results we'll get here, I think, will, will help to tell us that. Um, I'm just going to skip over that, but um, I don't want this to be an academic exercise. Uh, we want to focus it to us as a community um, and to help us answer some key things and sort of focus our work going forward. So one of those areas um, will be in the design of an optimal monitoring strategy. Um, as we've heard, there is this trade-off. We simply can't monitor everything everywhere. Um, so are there um, yeah, particular taxonomic groups that we haven't monitored well, which we should be focusing as a community on in the future? So can this help us to identify islands where eradications are going on, where collectively we think it's important to invest more heavily in monitoring certain taxonomic groups? Um, and if so, can we collectively think of a funding strategy that can help to facilitate that? Um, and the last one... I won't go through the slide, this is a bit of a brain dump, um, but we can talk about it more hopefully tomorrow. It's uh, the idea of developing a decision tree for practitioners. So if you're um, embarking on an eradication operation, should you be monitoring? Maybe not. Um, what are the factors that govern how you decide that? And what types of things should you monitor in your case uh, if you're going to go ahead with monitoring? So I'll leave it there uh, and simply say, yeah, have a think how you can get out of your whiskey distillery tour tomorrow to come and chat to us about monitoring in the afternoon. So thanks very much. Thank you for that interesting scenario. Have you included in any of that any thought about monitoring changes of vegetation which may impact upon the species that you're doing. Absolutely, yeah. So one of the groups that we've picked out is native vegetation. Um, we've not yet selected sort of habitat types as well. Um, so that's kind of a catch-all. And I'd be quite keen to talk to people whether we should be separating out, you know, monitoring of individual target plant species responses versus monitoring overall vegetation recovery. Thank you. Questions? One or two there, Sue Yeah, so the question was whether there's a way of working out what the mini minimum amount of monitoring we can do to, uh, to illustrate the change we're trying to see. Uh, it kind of depends where your focus is. So if that is um, a species-specific focus for an end goal, um, then, then yes, I think there are. I don't know what they are, but I know, um, Mike, you might know, Rachel Buxton, for seabirds at least, has been developing a tool. I think it's an app that you can use to tell you what's the minimum amount you'd need to do to detect a change um, following eradication. Um, but I don't think anything like that exists yet for other things. If it's a broader surveillance monitoring program, it's very difficult to know what's enough when you don't know what it is necessarily you're trying to illustrate. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, come along tomorrow, Surat. Come along uh, tomorrow. Let's talk about yeah. it. Yeah. John, back. I think it's uh, difficult to see how you can do a proper, proper adaptive management and an eradication, sort of reintroducing the tests for eradicating. Monitoring. And so the point I'm getting to is I think monitoring for sustained control of the test control is quite different because you want to know whether you've killed enough and so maintain the low enough density. Eradication is either or, and you get what you get. So it's a quite different purpose for monitoring the outcomes from one from the outcome the control versus the eradication. So you have eradication and adaptive management up there, but I don't can't see too really So I, I guess it's um, being aware, say on Macquarie Island, for example, we have a whole suite of changes in the ecosystem that are taking place now. Um, where having a broader surveillance monitoring program allows you to do a next step. So, yeah, we're not going to reintroduce rodents, but maybe now we'll need to think about invasive plants more carefully as they're regrowing following rad rabbit control. Since you've got birds that you can advocate, bring the cats back. <laughs> 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 but, um, as we move more and more towards eradication, we'll have the arms, if you've got any plans to incorporate yeah, monitoring for Yeah, absolutely no, I'm afraid I don't. Um, I think it's a really valid um, question and, and point, yeah. Um, we need as a community to understand more of the, the sort of human health impacts, so, yeah. Okay, thank you, folks, thank you very much. <laughs>